and welcome to the AM show, the second day of the week. Your energy is about 90%, but we are here, right here, on your best breakfast show on the block. My name is Sweetie Abochi, and I do this with Benjamin Akakbo. In today's lineup, we'll start with the news that matters to you, and then we'll have an extended news review segment. Dr. Wisdom Dogbe, who's a financial analyst, will be joined by Kojo Poku, an energy expert, both of them on our new segment, news review segment this morning. And then Muftao Nabila Abdullahi will bring you AM Sports and then the big conversations begin. Now this morning we have an exclusive interview on AM Exclusive and we'll engage the Registrar of Companies, Madam Jemima Owari, on all you need to know about registering your company and related matters. You don't want to miss that conversation with me later on in the show. Later again, we will take you or join the Stambi Graphic Business Breakfast event and bring you other interesting developments right here on the AM show. So let's start with the AM news now. Stick with us. Welcome to the program. This is AM News. Details now. Ghanaian businesses are expecting mixed reactions from the investments world towards Ghana's completion of its external debt restructuring. According to them, there will be positive reactions to the milestone by some investors who will now consider the certainties around their investments should or uh, their investments will put money into the Ghanaian economy. But there will also be some reluctance on the part of others who would rather want to invest in other economies than Ghana due to their debt restructuring. More on that shortly. But first, here is Ghana's finance minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, who is assuring Ghanaians of a promising outlook for Ghana's economy after a successful conclusion of its debt restructuring program. He was speaking at a town hall meeting at Trinity Baptist Church in Croydon, United Kingdom. One of the conditions was that Ghana had to do what we call debt operation. We had to go and restructure our debts because our debts were considered unsustainable. I want to announce, for those of you who are interested in the debt restructuring, which has become Ghana's most difficult problem for the past two, three years, we are bringing it to an end. We are bringing the debt restructuring to an end. Last two weeks, we concluded negotiation with the official creditors and we've agreed to restructure $5.1 billion. And I'm telling you, your government is good in negotiation. Of the $5.1 billion, we are going to make a savings of about $2 billion. Two billion. As I speak to you, tomorrow morning, there will be an announcement that we have also concluded our negotiation with the euro bond holders, $13.1 billion. And ladies and gentlemen, when we announce it, please read the details. We have negotiated a good deal for Ghana. That will save us $8 billion. He is hopeful the conclusion of the program will signal a turning point for the economy. Wait until the announcement. The confidence in our economy is going to come back stronger because the world is no longer interested in investing in Ghana because of those debt restructuring. After tomorrow, it will be a different story. Watch the CD to the dollar after tomorrow. I know you are interested in that story. Let's watch it and see. The confidence will come. The investors will return to Ghana and the growth trajectory would even become clearer for all of us. So this election is an election for us to win. The NDC can no longer campaign on the economy. Our record is better than their record. On the size of the economy, we've done better than them. On per capita income, we've done better than them. On job creation, we've done better than them. On economic growth, we've done better than them. They say we went to IMF, but it's not easy to be an, under an IMF program because we've seen them before. When they were under the IMF program by 2016, they missed all the targets. So far, Ghana has become an example. We met all our prior conditions and the IMF praised us and disbursed $600 million. This economy will grow and it will grow faster than everybody thinks. By the end of this year, we are supposed to grow at 3.2%. But I can tell you, we will grow at 5% or even more than 5%. This is because of the pragmatic policies we are, we are implementing as a government. And so don't let anybody talk you down. You should raise your head up and you know that your government is doing the right thing. We are bringing the economy back. That's the finance minister. In other stories, movements for change leader Alan Kojo Chermanteng has promised to transform the country through his great transformational plan, 
by focusing mainly on economic and infrastructural development, improving social services, and maximizing agricultural productivity. The former trade minister said this, and he said he will eliminate sole sourcing of government's projects, reducing government spending and financing on infrastructural projects by 60%, and work with a government made up of not more than 40 ministers. There's a lot of money floating around in the world. Government does not need to continue building roads. Every politician would like to build roads because that's where the corruption starts. Because that's where the contracting starts. But if you go to some of the powerful economies in the world, most of the roads uh, were built by private sector capital. Even international airports, first class international airports are owned by the private sector. In Ghana, because people want to borrow to finance the construction of an airport, they will tell you that for security reasons, the government has to borrow and construct the airport. Well, Alan Chumantin has also promised to introduce a fixed exchange rate for six months on import duties. This measure, he believes, will curtail the constant uh, price fluctuations of goods and services and bring inflation under control. It is also a measure that he believes will stabilize the city. On, on low inflation, fix the foreign exchange rate for the importation of strategic commodities, such as petroleum and essential medicines, below the prevailing foreign exchange market rate, as a second forex window, as a short-term policy measure, in order to reduce the pass-through effects of the depreciation of the local currency on strategic commodity prices. As a country, we have no choice but to import petroleum products until we start adding value to our oil and gas resources. If your city is depreciating and you allow the exchange rate, the depreciating rate, to influence the price of petroleum products, then obviously the prices of all goods, because of the multiply effect of petroleum, would always be on the right. So you have to ring fence the depreciation of the city in respect of products that are of a strategic nature and you have no choice to import them. If we do this, we'll stabilize the currency. Moving on, to help promote sports development and youth empowerment, the New Patriotic Party's parliamentary candidate for the Pusiga constituency, Alhaji Abdul Hanan Aludiba, has commissioned a state of the art football astroturf for the constituency. The facility, which was constructed in partnership with the Ghana National Gas Company, will also serve as a venue for public gatherings and events in the Upper East region. Our correspondent, Albert Sorry, reports. The newly commissioned football astroturf is part of Alhaji Hanan Abdul Wahab Aludibe's campaign promise to enhance sports infrastructure in the Pusiga constituency. The facility is expected to provide a conducive environment for young footballers to hone their skills and potentially become future stars. The facility has also been designed to be used for public functions such as the Independence Day parades Eid prayers, among others. The MPP's parliamentary candidate for Pusiga said he lobbied the Ghana National Gas Company to bring the facility to the deprived area because he believed in the enormous talents that abound there. A year ago, we came to Council for the construction of the Astrotech. Some said it was a sun. But today, we can see the reality. Thank you. 
The commissioning ceremony was attended by the Minister of Youth and Sports, Yusuf Mustafa, some MPP bigwigs, and former Black Stars players, including Stephen Apia, Lai Kingston, John Pencil, and Emmanuel Ajiman Bedu. The Sports Minister commended Alhaji Hanan al for his initiative and reiterated the government's commitment to grassroots sports development. The project manager of Ghana National Gas Company Limited, Adam Boli Anima, urged the people of Pusiga to maintain the new sports facility so it can serve them for a long time. Black Stars players engaged with the youth and shared their experiences. They also joined select sites of the youth of Pusiga to play a friendly football match as their way of inspiring the next generation of football talents. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, Pusiga. Let's stay on the Northern Belt, where Member of Parliament for Wild West constituency, Superintendent retired Peter Lanchintobu, has stated that peace is gradually returning to Kando and Lassia Tolu following the communal conflict in the enclave that claimed three lives. He said most residents who fled from the conflict have now returned and majority back to the farms for their farming activities. <clears throat> Interacting with chiefs and opinion leaders of the feuding factions, he called on them to work to ensure that there is total peace in the area. Join you, Sapa West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam reports from Wichiao. Since the conflict erupted on June 15 between the people of Kendew and Lassie Tolu, who claimed three lives, dozens of security personnel drawn from the military, police, and the immigration services have been strategically deployed to the conflict communities to restore and maintain peace in the area. Feeding of these security personnel solely rely on the soldiers of the government through the World West District Assembly. To complement the effort of the government, Member of Parliament for World West, Superintendent Retired Peter Lajire Tubu donated food items worth 10,000 Ghana cities to the World West District Security Council for the feeding needs of the personnel stationed in the conflict area. We said security is a collective responsibility. So security is not only about talking about it, believing in the peace, believing in the men and women in uniform, but also contributing tangibly to support the effectiveness of the operations on the ground. Superintendent retired Peter Lanjiri Tubu then moved to the palace of the paramount chief of the Wuchao traditional area, Na Imorogoma, whose jurisdiction the two communities are under. His mission there is to meet and plead with him and his subjects on the need to bury the hatchet and let peace prevail in the predominant farming enclave. All those who believe in peace, and they believe that Huawei should remain peaceful. And they believe that the conflict between Lase, Tulu, and Kandel should be resolved to the detail so that we'll never experience such a thing again. There's uneasy calm in the area following the incident a week ago. But the significant thing to report now is that people are now back to the communities and farmers are back to their farms doing their normal duties. This morning while I was coming, I saw a lot of women in the farm sewing. That is a sign of peace. Even though nobody would have, been, have, nobody would have had the balls 
to go to the farm at this material moment. This is farming season. If we can't go to farm, it means that we are praying for famine. We are praying for hunger. But I'm happy that I can see the revival of the system. But let's not take things for granted. At Kendall, he entreated the chiefs and people of the area to swallow their anger and give peace a chance. One major concern raised and who they will want an intervention from the member of parliament was the continuous keeping of the deceased at the mock for autopsy and holding of suspects at the police cells. Superintendent retired Peter Lentino Tubu has this response for them. And I'll plead with all of you, be patient with the police. They know what they are doing. And I'm sure that at the end of the day, all of us will be happy. Nobody wants to be in cells. The policemen who are on duty here, sleeping in the, in, the, in the bush every night, they don't want to be here like that. But they are here because it's their national duty. So let's be patient with them. And let them do what is right. So all of us will have the peace. The message at last year to Lu was a carbon copy of what transpired at Kendiao. He reiterated that the conflict is between two communities and they have made frantic effort to resolve it, urging the public to disregard the misinformation and disinformation which can worsen the conflict situation in the area. I have said it from day one. Lase, Tolu and Kandyo have had a conflict. And the conflict is about the land in Lase. So the conflict is between Kandyo and Lase, Tolu. The conflict is not between the brief force in Ghana and the wireless in Ghana. If that was the case, I am sure that a lot of briefers who are living in Wat Town would have vacated their residence. But that is not the case. There are a lot of Wala people and briefers people who are working together. For instance, in Asanku, Asankregua, there are a lot of them in Sefi. There are a lot of them in Accra. The conflict is not a tribal conflict. It is not between Wala people and the briefers people. It is the conflict between these two communities, Kendel and Lase Tulu. And I'm restricting it so that we don't stretch it beyond limits. But I'm hopeful that with the way I'm seeing the chief speak and the elders speak and the response from the youth, there is hope for the future. One thing significant which was exhibited during the tour by the factions recognizes the need to maintain the peace in the area which they both resolve to work towards achieving. The return of the people to their farms is also good for the optics. Reporting for the news, Rafik Salam, Wachao. The National Association of Graduate Teachers have undertaken an initiative aimed at enhancing academic performance among pupils at the basic level in Afajeto South District. This includes building the capacity of teachers and awarding best performing students to serve as motivation to whip up the interest of pupils in education. There's more in the following report. The Afajatu South District within the last three years has not performed creditably well in the basic education certificate examination, with the highest pass rate at 75% in 2023. The District Director of Education, Akpene Yvonne Ame Bruce, said some measures are being implemented to improve performance. What we lack when it comes to the results is that we want single digits, let's say aggregate six to nine, and that is what we are not getting. We pray and hope that when we put in all the best strategies that we have, we will be able to attain those aggregates. So gone on to intensify monitoring, and it is a mass monitoring. We have intensified literacy and numeracy in the first hours of the day. We have also gone into grooming our teachers. To complement the efforts of the Education Directorate, the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, instituted an award scheme among other initiatives. World Performing Students in the 2023 BECE were decorated with citations. The Nagrat National Gender Desk Coordinator, Rebecca Okran, said the initiative aligns with the outfit's aim of ensuring quality education delivery. Apart from fighting for better conditions of service for our teachers to enable them to go teach with all the passion that they need to teach with, we are also here today in Hawaii promoting the same agenda through our students by awarding, rewarding and motivating those who have done 
done well and even encouraging those who are about to write the BEC. Remember, these are our children and we will go all lengths to make sure that they turn out well, especially um, pupils from basic uh, public schools. They are equally good and when given the needed push, they are going to excel. The Afajato South NDC parliamentary candidate, Frank Efriye, said he is visioned to introduce several interventions in education when voted into office. I wish to place scholarship issuance at the forefront of my educational drive. I will give scholarship in terms of future and further education to these little ones and I will enhance education among parents so that they know the true essence and value and significance of education. Likewise, I will try and partner with some other NGOs, CSOs, in order to bring education favors and a partnership to the district. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, The Kulim. Benjamin Akakbo is up next with business updates. Welcome aboard the business updates. Now in our first story, economist Professor Peter Quarte is upbeat about market certainty, investor confidence, and the unlocking of some key resources following an official announcement of an end to Ghana's debt restructuring. According to government, it had successfully restructured its debt of $5.1 billion with these creditors, in addition to concluding the restructuring of $13.1 billion with eurobond holders. To this end, about $8 billion in interest payments have been saved. Reacting to this development, Professor Kwati urged government to invest the savings in the productive sectors of the economy to be able to pay these debts when they mature. I think we will bring certainty, some relative certainty to the market, to, to the minds of investors, to the minds of Ghanaians, uh, because uh, it's taken it's quite a long time to come this far. Uh, you don't know whether they will agree to the terms and what the terms will be, its impact on our investment, interest payment, etc. But now we are close to knowing exactly what the, the terms are. And, and I think that brings certainty to the market and that can have some positive effects on the exchange rate and by extension uh, inflation and inflation expectations. We can also see that there, there is going to be some savings mm. and with this amount of savings that is coming to uh, government, it could be channeled into other more productive areas that will stimulate production, can stimulate growth and, and employment in the immediate term. Um, we would also see, uh, or we're going to also see that with a restructuring, it's going to free some resources because um, if government has to pay the debts today or to pay this year, it means it has to find this money to pay interest and, and uh, also service the debt. Now, rural and community banks across the country are being offered a new platform by the Ghana Stock Exchange uh, to use in raising additional capital to support their operations. Now, the move is born out of the creation of the first official over-the-counter market by the Ghana Stock Exchange and the Securities and Exchange Commission for companies not listed on the bourse to trade. Now, uh, speaking to Joy Business, Managing Director of the Exchange, Abana Amwa disclosed that the rural and community banks will also have the opportunity of improving transparency uh, to their shareholders through the new platform. We think that if we do this, their shareholders will be able to see what is the price of our share. They will be able to see investor appetite, other investors who have appetite to buy the shares. They will be able to, those who want to buy more, will know where to go to buy more because it will all be transparent. But importantly, by organizing them, we think the rural banks themselves can now have a market where they can raise additional capital. Many of them need additional capital. So using a more organized market, they'll be able to reach a wider range of investors, raise more capital, and serve the purposes of our communities and rural uh, institutions that are trying to grow. Again, the GSE provides a very important governance framework 
for these banks. So as they come to the GSE, we think some of the best practices of governance, stronger governance that ensures growth and sustainability of the business will come to rub off on many of these companies. So our hope is to organize this market, let investors benefit, but also let the companies benefit and essentially the ultimate beneficiary is our community, it's our SMEs, it's all Ghana who will benefit from the supply. And that's it for business, handing over back to Sweetie Kabochi. AM News on the AM show on the Joy News channel. Stay with us. We have a lot more coming your way in the next four hours. Well, thank you for staying with us right here on the AM Show. Time now for the news review, and I'll be introducing my guests to you shortly. But this segment, as always, is brought to you courtesy of Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. If you've not heard of them, please pay attention. If you're a man, and you know people of African descent are prone to prostate-related issues. In fact, yesterday when uh, Dr. Ifua Kome was here, she enhanced you know, the talk about that. If you're a man... They're offering you prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, do you know your fertility status? Do you know what is going on there? Do you know whether you can carry a pregnancy to term? Do you know whether fibroids are developing? Do you know whether those lesions um, in your reproductive area that could lead to cancer, cervical cancer in the future, are forming? The good thing is, the earlier you go, the better uh, you will be because you get to know early and you can stem the tide of those. For you, if you're a woman, they're offering you fertility screening gratis for free. You'll pay zilch. So this morning, I am proffering their branches to you, dotted across the country. Go to any of them, starting with Accra, Spintex, opposite the Shell sign board. There's Kumasi Kronumabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takra de Anaji Estate, Tema Community 22, Tichiman Hanswa, and a Siama Enzema. I'm sure you'd like to give them a call and book an appointment. There are two numbers. One, 0244 867 068 or 0274 234 321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. And the start of the news review. I have two guests this morning joining the conversation. Kojo Poku is an energy analyst. He's also on the Committee for Energy, uh, the campaign team for energy or committee on energy for the Dr. Mahmoud Baumia presidential bid. He joins the conversation. We also have Wisdom Kofi Dogbe, a finance analyst. And I just want to say this, Wisdom, I know you're going through a lot right now, which we can't share on air, but, <laughs> and you've had to wake up very early because you're across the world. But thank you for making the time uh, to join us this morning. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Ben. How are you? I am well. How about you? I'm very well. Um, the rate at which you now know this number of head, uh, I'm sure you've been booking a lot of appointments. Eh? How do you know I'm not reading the number? I don't know because you, you don't seem to blink. You are just basically bringing it from the memory. So I think you've been booking that appointment quite often. <laughs> Well, not for me, obviously. <laughs> there you go, starting the day on a mischievous note. Makojo, uh, it's, good. it's always good to have you join the conversation. Same with you, Wisdom. Gentlemen, let's quickly get your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> make them pretty brief. There's a whole lot to digest, and we have extra time so that we can make m the most of the time. Kojo, I'll start with you. Uh, thoughts for us this morning? Any brief thoughts? A minute yes, and a half. Um, you know, I actually sent you a message. I think um, there's something that um, Joy should do. I think when you guys are presenting, um, the same way you guys put our names, I think you should put your names, the producers should put your names under the host. I think it mm -hmm. helps your viewers know the names of the host because you know that instance where somebody thought when I was calling uh, Madame Sweetie Abuchi, Sweetie, and the person, uh, one Amelia Amate, uh, put me on Facebook that I was being condescended. 
and mm -hmm. she didn't know that Sweetie was actually called Sweetie Abuchi. You know, so I think it will help if you guys um, put your names when you are hosting. Your names keep coming up beneath you, so to let people know what your names are. All right. Thank, thank you for the suggestion. Um, all right. Um, I do know that you were adding in, in that conversation, and I think the lady, I went and saw the post. She was saying, sweetie, I, I think for her, Kojo, I'm not trying to defend it, but for her, she heard you say, sweetie, and then she heard you say a lot of, my dear, my dear, my dear. So she felt a bit, you know that tag, and um, it, 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 has a, it has a certain connotation in certain contexts, or generally. I mean, let's assume here at work, I wouldn't go around calling her my dear and all of that. So I, some others, I had a conversation with some others, and they also said, okay, that's a problem. So, Kojo, uh, maybe we can just stick to her name, and that is it. That's, that's just on the well, lighter side. I don't think the problem was with the my dear. Her problem was she said that I keep calling her sweetie. So let's not divert yeah. from what the problem is. She she didn't know her name was Sweetie. Oh, I think That's I think she, she mentioned I, I think she mentioned the my dear bit as well. Yes, she mentioned that as well. But what I'm saying is that her concern, if you read the post, the post was to say that we need to teach this our men and children manners. I mean, if, I mean, she doesn't know. So let's put it out there and, and let her know that the lady is called Sweetie Abuchi. Yeah. I will not come on TV and call somebody sweetie. I've been doing TV for 12 years, and, I, and I'm very versed on manners. Right. Uh, thank you so much. But let me also say this uh, for everybody out there. Sometimes, please, don't, don't, take, don't take matters um, too hard out of context. If you don't know something, don't, don't say what you don't uh, know. I felt a bit bad when I read that comment. And uh, all you could have done was check was the lady's name. And, and all that would have ended. But thank you, um, Kojo, for your thoughts. Let me go to Wisdom. Quick thoughts? Any quick reflections for us this morning? Sure, Kojo. Nice to meet you. And I, I would say that actually happened to me. Somebody asked me, why did you call her sweetie? You know, and I had to say that that's a name. In my case, it didn't end in any kind of argument. It was pretty a simple question, and I just had to answer that. But Ben, I said, uh, uh, let me go to my topic for uh, this morning. I said it a few times here that I like to support courses that promote diversity and also equity, including empowering women and also supporting the underprivileged minorities in our society. So evidently, I will support this affirmative action bill that seeks to ensure uh, gender equality. If it takes a fair and also inclusive approach within the confines of the Constitution. Now, I heard briefly that uh, the former minority leader in Parliament, he had concerns about the bill because certain provisions in the bill blatantly violate the provisions in the Constitution. And I need to understand that, right, what exact provisions that uh, he was talking about. But I'll be surprised if anyone would craft a bill with provisions that con uh, contravene the laws of the land. So if that is the case, I will hope that the framers of the bill will get back to the drawing board, right. clearly define what the goals and objectives of the affirmative action bill uh, are, including what, is the, uh, what they are trying to identify and calling out, uh, in the specific areas where we still have gender inequalities, you know, such as leadership representation and positions that require uh, appointment and not election. Because for elected positions, the principle of fairness and competition will not always support uh, much of an affirmative action here. So I think Parliament can enact into laws provisions that require policies or uh, uh, implementation of policies and practices that will promote inclusivity and also reduce a bias against women and, and the disabled. But I'm doubtful that our parliament can actually pass in a bill that will not survive uh, uh, the test of, of the Constitution. Well, thank you, Wisdom, for your thoughts. Let's get quickly into the papers now. I'll start with the Ghanaian Times newspaper, and we'll do some online portals at the end of this conversation. So 2024 election, don't endorse presidential candidates, clergy, admonished. There's also communications minister launches foundation to empower youth and women and Ghana's Eurobond holders reach agreement with government on debt restructuring. I've been listening to the finance minister and some of what he's been saying. 
which left me scratching my head. And, and I, I, I was wondering, I mean, Dr. Amin, Adam took over and interesting setup. We've been supporting him. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing him saying certain things. And I'm wondering, is he feeding into the politics? And then you would hear, uh, is it uh, Professor... Um, uh, it's not Awandare, the other one, I'll, I'll get his name, also making mention, and others that uh, we don't know where these figures are coming from, and it's lopsided, but we'll get into that. GOC unveils plans to mark Olympic Day, and Swatriman FC win MTNFA Cup. Uh, they claimed their first major trophy after beating Bofuakwa Tano by four, five goals to four on penalties to win the 2023-2024 MTNFA Cup on Sunday at the, the University of Ghana Stadium in Lagon. I, I've noticed a few things, though, about the University of Ghana Stadium, and I'm wondering, uh, how much did we say we expended again? Was it 30-something million or something like that? I don't know. Uh, there was a figure. I think that was the total, but there was a figure for the stadium, uh, even though, though it was done before the All-African Games. I'm wondering uh, whether we're going to keep up with those investments so that it doesn't become another one of those. You do it, and then after a short while, it, it starts to deteriorate. GPL DOL clubs urged to acquire SNIT clearance certificates. All of that in sports. But let's get to some of the major issues. I'll start from page 8, then go to page uh, 9 as well. <clears throat> With campaign trails for the 2024 general elections gathering momentum by the day, the clergy has been admonished uh, to avoid predicting victory for and endorsing presidential candidates to prevent factionalism in the church. According to the moderator of the General Assembly of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church Ghana, Right Reverend Dr. Lieutenant uh, Retired Bliss Agbeko, disunity in the church would affect the country's peace. Quoting him, he says, What we as church leaders need to do now is to continue to pray with our congreg congregations to allow God to choose our leaders through us. Uh, he told the Jolo Bogame congregation of the church in the Hoes district on Sunday. Now, Right Reverend Agbeko was delivering a sermon on the theme, Patience and Peace in Personal Storm. This brings to mind many things. And these are my thoughts before I come to you, gentlemen. If you want to talk about politics and leaders, then talk about all of them. Don't be like some of those who in the past would speak under a certain administration and would not speak now. Speak all the time, which is my policy. The other bit is, if you want to stick your neck out, and do that, then also know that some people are not going to be very fair in their assessment of you. And you should understand that before you go there. Also note, your congregations are not only from one end. They are from different spectrums. So don't expect that if you preach a certain way, um, I don't know. But there are so many dynamics. And sometimes I don't get why some of our preachers, instead of staying neutral, want to expose themselves. And then when they catch you know, fire, they act a certain way. Um, maybe later I'll talk about women's aglow and some of the prayers they've been praying now and all of that. But I'll start with you, um, Wisdom Dugwick. Thoughts? <clears throat> well, I think that a church has a, a key role to play when it comes to educating folks on uh, how to vote and uh, what are the issues they should be thinking about, right? So, but uh, to your point, I do believe that they also have to remain uh, neutral. But I also want to segue a little bit to a call by the former General Secretary of, uh, uh, of the Christian Council of Ghana. Uh, his call was to improve the election process. And I think that that is a good call, especially with all of the challenges that uh, the EC has experienced in a voter registration exercise and also other activities of the EC. <clears throat> I would take it a, a step further, right, to say that Improving the elections really is not the responsibility of only the EC, but all the stakeholders, including the media, the religious bodies, just like you mentioned, and also the general public. Everyone has to do their part to improve the election process and to ensure a free and fair elections and also peaceful transfer of power. Then, I think that this call <clears throat> from my Rev. Punifrin, I think that's the name, from uh, the clergy, I think that will resonate with the voters. If you think about the role of the clergy in moral guidance, in conflict resolution, and in also in, a, a, in peace education, it becomes clear that their roles and also their voices are very, very significant in these elections. 
Right. But we have, we have few cases of public officials, right? And also institutions such as uh, the EC are missing opportunities to show uh, uh, fairness and also transparency in some instances. And that is why this call is very relevant. I heard about uh, significant lapses on the part of the EC and how they reported inaccurate numbers in some instances. Thankfully, some of these have been corrected. But these things don't give Ghanaians the assurance that they can fully trust the key institutions of government to deliver fair and also transparent elections. And also, lastly, right, the EC has been getting quite some negative attention, especially during the voter reg registration exercise. But to be honest, it is the wrong timing for them to be on the news for these issues. We are in an election year, and it is imperative for, on them to do all that it takes to gain the trust of the public and the confidence of the people ahead of the elections. Thank you for those thoughts, Kojo. Um, my brother, I don't see where and how uh, pastors all of a sudden are not supposed to be part of politics. In the distant future, the, the church was the politics. The two have piggy banked each other for a very long time. And I don't know why anybody thinks that a pastor or a clergy cannot basically have a political view. They can and they should. Um, what the, my leader, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, has done uh, when we went around the 16 regions, the first thing we did in every region is to engage the clergy and the men of God and the faith, the people who, led, who lead these faith-based organizations. And the, 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 the strategy was clear. You need to let the people who lead the force, the people who basically stand in the pulpit to preach, understand the message that you are bringing. Because every Sunday, twice a week, they stand in front of this congregation and they basically um, preach to the people. So they also need to understand the policy of the politics, not just the hearsay. If they are well informed, then they can give a very um, solid view if they, they choose to go that way. And that is why um, the DMV campaign engage all the clergy. Now, if a clergy buys into a message and decides to basically profess in a certain direction, there's nothing wrong with it. We have had so many instances where the church and the politics have gone hand in hand. So I don't see why all of a sudden we want to now come in and say, oh, no, pastors should not uh, be into politics and they should be in the middle. Where does it say that? Are you done? Yes. Okay. I never Thank said you. anywhere <clears throat> that pastors or men of the cloth, in fact, I'm Catholic, so I, I know this very well. I don't know the last time you saw a Catholic priest or a reverend sister going out there espousing political thoughts, but they do vote, don't they? The point is that I hear, depending on what I see, I have my political thoughts. I have my political leanings, depending on who's in power, who's trying to get in power, and what is happening in the country. Do I go espousing my political thoughts? No. The point I am making, just as with chiefs, religious leaders don't go acting like, I am clearly here, I'm clearly there. They will vote. They will express their political opinion. No one is taking that away from them. But right. all I am you saying, when, when you were speaking, I allowed you to speak, Kojo. All okay. I am saying is that if you are going to stick your neck out and say, I am mm -hmm. for Mahama, or I am for Baumia, yes. or show clearly, then mm -hmm. also be ready for what comes with it. After all, aren't there many, the Eastwood Annabes and so many of the others, do you hear them espousing any political thoughts? But don't they preach about the state of the country? Don't they preach about goings on in the country, detaching themselves from politics? But you're talking about it. That's all I'm saying. Ben, so this ben, bit about and can they like, get political and all chiefs, of that, I don't understand. Ben, when you mention the chiefs, there is a constitution provision. I, I mentioned them in passing. No, no, I know no, that pastors are land. not mentioned ben, in the you constitution. Are talking like, I allowed you to talk. Let me learn. The chiefs, there's a constitutional provision that says that chiefs should not. There is no constitutional provision that says pastors and clergy should not. I never no, said there was. The Catholics. No, no, let me, let me, like, the Catholics, the Catholics, look, Clearly, you said one thing, and I agree with you on that. If they stick their neck out, they are sticking it out, and they are ready for the consequences. So I don't think they are oblivious of the fact that what they are doing has consequences. Let's leave the chief, the pastors, to be pastors. Okay, let's leave them to do that. Um, just the correction, wisdom. So it's not um, 
Reverend Frimpon is Right Reverend Agbeko. He is moderator of the General Assembly of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, Ghana, just so you know. Um, let's get into other stories. GSS launches eighth round of Ghana Living Standard Survey. And the eighth round of the Ghana Living Standard Survey, uh, that is GLSS 8, aimed at providing data on welfare and living conditions of individuals with households in Ghana to help with socioeconomic planning, was yesterday launched in Accra. The GLSS is a nationally representative household survey which is conducted by the Ghana Statistical Service every five years to provide reliable, disaggregated and internationally uh, comparable statistics on welfare and living conditions of individuals and households. And let me just give you some detail on that because we singled out a few of those. I used part of them in my blunt thoughts on Friday. If you look at the data, <clears throat> And I'll just quickly get into it so uh, you can do your analysis on that. And you look at multidimensional poverty uh, statistics. You would find that 7.3 million persons in Ghana are multidimensionally poor. We're talking about education, employment, so many uh, different dimensions. That literally means that one in four Ghanaians is multidimensionally poor. And there are levels to poverty. Uh, that is if you take the population of 30.08 uh, million. Now, 43.8% of the multidimensionally poor persons experience severe poverty. And um, it goes on when you look at the breakdown. So those who are multidimensionally poor in the, the employment category, 32.6%. Uh, in, in terms of living conditions, 27.9%. In terms of health, and all the dynamics, 21.7%, and in terms of education, 17.8%. I'll leave it there uh, for now. Wisdom, I'll start with you on, on, on that. Uh, what are your thoughts? And interestingly, because of the numbers, uh, you would find that in the Ashanti region, for example, which is the highest, 959,000 uh, people, almost 1 million people, but it's also because of the population, is the highest, uh, Greater Accra, is in third with 627.6K. Uh, Any thoughts, wisdom, before I go to Kojo? Ben, I will say this, right? I missed this uh, on the news, so I'm not on top of this one, but you mentioned something that really caught my attention. You said 7.3 million people are below the poverty line. That is They, they, they are experiencing multidimensional poverty. If you follow the trend after COVID, post-COVID, We've been told that about 800,000 to 1 million Ghanaians have fallen, uh, you know, in, in below the poverty line. But as far as this statistic is concerned, 7.3 million Ghanaians are multidimensionally uh, poor. Look, I think we need to change course as a nation, right? I'd, I've heard uh, the finance minister talking about uh, the Ghanaian economy being better than uh, previous administrations and all of that stuff. You know, it sounded so good. But in hearing you talk about these numbers here, it gives me a, a little bit of a chill. Unemployment is still high, right? People are struggling to find jobs. Poverty is a, a big issue. So I think that we should be pursuing, uh, pursuing policies that will help our people bring them out of unemployment, bring them out of poverty, give people equal opportunities. I think that is what the government should be working towards. And not just throwing out uh, a rhetoric that uh, uh, the economy is better today. I think anybody who is bold enough to make a statement of that nature, right, that the economy is better today compared to a previous administration where people were much better off, I think that statement is disingenuous and that is a, a level of boldness that I wish I had. All right. Uh, thank you, Wisdom. Kojo? Well, um, Ben, I, I don't think we should, whenever it comes to some of these indexes, uh, we shouldn't be quick to jump at the truth of government um, to say that, oh, government is making rhetoric and people are in multidimensional um, poverty index. Uh, you know, it is a gauge of people's um, health, education. There are multifacets that goes into the index that has come out, which is the survey that they do. Clearly, um, rural Ghana um, is it's, it's dire. And uh, the reason some of us are getting into politics is to basically bring the living standard in rural Ghana to basically closer. It can't be the same as urban Ghana, 
But if you go around the country and look at the living standards in the rural communities, that's why when you mentioned my home um, region, Ashanti region, I would tend to agree with you because there is quite a number of rural Ghana in the Ashanti region. And if you go there and you look at the indexes of health, education, and the living standards, it's quite low um, compared to um, the index which they are using, which is uh, a global index, okay? So let's not be quick to jump on the which, truth of Which Ghana. index are you talking about that is the global index? Well, the, the, the multidimensional, the survey they did, if no, you, it, it you it is come not, up with that. Just to clarify for you, it is not. Every country has its own. I was actually at the launch. I hosted this event, Kojo, so okay. uh, careful where you go on that. Oh, but, but um, um, every country has its own scheme per certain um, statistical requirements, per certain standards that are to be met, okay? And I'm telling you that this is purely Ghanaian. It has nothing to do with any global I'm not thing. saying this is that, the GSS but the, the, doing the it. index, you have to compare. For you to say a certain percentage, you have to have a benchmark. And below that benchmark is what you are classifying. To do any survey, there should be a benchmark. That benchmark was not a local benchmark. It's an international benchmark. The MPI, which is the Multidimensional Poverty Index, is what they use it to, um, to basically gauge the... Do, do you know for, so how you long, for how long we've had some of these uh, statistics? And I'm not necessarily... Yes, even multidimensional poverty indices. But do you know over the years, over the decades, how, how many times we've had some generation, whether it's from the census or, or all that, when it comes to these reports? Do you know? No, I, ben, I'm, what I'm trying to point, point, point out is that we have a benchmark to which we compare these indexes to grade that 7.7.1. They didn't come into Ghana and said everybody was multidimensional poor. They said that 7.3 7 million Ghanaians are multidimensional. What it means is that they compare the living standard, the educational standard, and the health standard against a certain standard. Okay, so what I'm saying is that the MPI, which is what they use to doing these things, is not a locally developed. But what the, my point is this. Government, and every government for that matter, has really failed to bring out rural um, development. And that is why there's a need to create more decentralization so that poverty elevation will go directly to people that need it. And for me, I think that we should go slow when we are quick to blame government on some of these things. But Kojo, let me ask you this, if you don't mind. Uh, are you saying that, let's get out of the indexes, right, or the statistics of things, and let's talk about things that matter to the average Guinean. Are we saying that because these indexes are usually low for the rural areas, it, should, it is acceptable? I don't understand that part. No, not at all. I never said that. What I'm saying is that this, the, the index is an, is an international index. The point I'm trying to point out is that it is, it is a measure of rural um, leave, standard of living, health, and education. And we all understand that in rural Ghana, these standards are low. One of the things that this government has done, and the creation of the 16 regions, which is six more regions to add to the 10, what it has done is it has actually decentralized a lot of these areas. A typical example is the Western North, the we also area. If you go and see the amount of development that they have gotten as a result of they becoming a region, as compared to when they were part of the Western region. So there are steps being done, but obviously, look, nobody said that we're a rich country. We are still a poor country, as we all know. So these things are happening, but I just thought that we should address the problem as a fundamental problem, but not to jump at the truth of government. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I just want to disagree with you on one point. Ghana has never been poor. If you look at natural resource, if you look at the human resource, if you look at ben. everything else oh, we've ben. been given, hold, hold oh, for me. Ben. When you're talking, when you're talking, I allow you to talk. Ghana has <laughs> never been poor. We've had leaders who are bereft of ideas, misleaders who are poor in their thinking. And I'm not singling anyone out. I'm just saying that over time. And it's not to say every last one of them, everyone in the leadership cycle. But I'm saying that we've had leaders who are not futuristic in their thinking. Leaders who say one thing and come and do something totally different. That has been a malaise. Don't tell me Ghana is poor. Ghana is not poor. But let's get into other stories. Um, on page nine of the paper, Ghana's eurobond holders reach agreement with government on debt restructuring. And the committee of holders of Ghana's eurobonds, that is the committee, has reached an agreement in principle with the government on a restructuring of the eurobonds. 
A statement issued by the committee yesterday and copied to the Ghanaian Times said the proposed agreement on the restructuring of the eurobonds would address Ghana's default on uh, the eurobonds in a manner that provided significant cash flow and debt stock relief to support the country's economic recovery in the context of the IMF financial program. And uh, so that is that with that story. As things go on, I, I think it was the, is it one of those entities recently revised its dollar CD rating, stating that it wouldn't be 13 point something anymore. It would be north of 15. I'm just praying, praying, hoping that the CD appreciates against these currencies. It started appreciating a bit, then it lost some 3 point something percent last week. And we're back to 15 point, you know, whatever. Now, it's, it's practically 16. The pound is north of 20 if you're buying. If you're selling, it's 19 point something. We need it to come down. Because I have friends who are schooling and paying from here in pounds and dollars. It's, it's a major headache. It's crazy. I have a friend who's had to stop uh, part of a dental program in the UK because, I mean, it's moved from what? Look at where it was two or so years ago to 20. You, you can't afford it. So, Mr. Dr. Finance Minister and Co., I mean, yes, you're doing your bit, but let it trickle down because that's where people will feel it. It's, it's, it's really bad. African leaders advised to double efforts towards attainment of SDGs by 2030. The special advisor to the President on Sustainable Development Goals, Dr. Eugene Owusu, has appealed to global leaders to double down on their efforts towards the attainment of the SDGs uh, by 2030. According to him, this had become necessary because despite the SDGs going past its midpoint of the time frame for implementation, not much had been achieved. And do you know what's interesting? If you look at the SDGs, the first three, you're looking at no poverty. We, we have, I'm sure, per the multidimensional poverty index, the indices we've been referencing, it is clear. If Kojo wants to go there, I would let him know that, in fact, it was admitted uh, while this MPI uh, was being uh, launched. Then you come to hunger and all of that. In fact, we are, we are pretty far behind. And, and not just Ghana, Africa, there's a lot of work uh, to be done. I'll just do... Let me look for this and add it. Then I can take your reflections and move to another paper. Um, 50 people infected with HIV daily in Ghana, Dr. Etiahene. And he said that right here on uh, this show. So the new HIV infection is the highest in the greater Accra with 4,221, followed by the Ashanti with 3,650, Eastern with 2,096, and Northeast with 112 being uh, the lowest. But the sad development is that over 17,000 uh, people got infected just last year. I think about 12,000 uh, of the number generally perished, and we're adding on about 50 every day. It appears um, a lot of work to be done there too. Kojo, I'll start with you on these points. Well, and then can we, we discuss the, the debt restructuring? Because that's a major story and I think we should spend some time discussing that. I don't know if you want to go into that or you want to leave it for a different um, you newspaper. You can talk about it. You can go ahead. Right. Okay. That's good. So it's good news. And um, you mentioned that the CD has been depreciation, which is um, the case when you have a lot of people betting against the currency, thinking that we will not be able to reach an agreement with our debtors in the euro bond and in the bilateral um, arrangement. Thank God it's been done. And I think um, we will see that there will be a decline in the, the, the uh, there will be appreciation of the currency because people will realize that now there is relief um, for the economy. We've been able to make some savings because the coupons, the rate, the interest rate on these coupons have been renegotiated. The tenure has been extended, which has yielded some savings to the nation in the long term. So basically, what tends to happen now for me is not what has been achieved by having to renegotiate these debts, because we shouldn't have gotten there in the first place. Some of us are on record in 2017 to say that, look, the, when we came into 2017, the country was in the IMF program. And the reason was that uh, the previous administration has really run the economy down and there was a need to change um, direction when we come out of that IMF program, which we exited in 2018. We didn't do that. And um, some of us have criticized that decision heavily that look, borrowing, borrowing, borrowing to solve our problem, which is something that I think is taught in economics and finance class that you can borrow yourself out of poverty. Ghana, we have gone the long haul and realized that we cannot borrow ourselves out of poverty. 
what we need to do is to basically come with programs that will help the country, one, balance its budget, spend what we have, and the diverse revenue streams that will help basically generate revenue internally. And that is why some of us are happy to basically sign on to the policy and the philosophy of Dr. Mahmoud Baumia going forward. All right. But um, sometimes I find it interesting, especially when aficionados of the MPP go like, oh, we're in the grips of an IMF program. You came and benefited from that program. Some of the indices, the benefits, the boons did not come in, in maybe 2015, thanks to some of those. I mean, there, there are the negatives of it. When we speak like there were no benefits, um, it's a conversation. But anyway, um, no, uh, um, and, and let me address that briefly. There wisdom, were benefits. Wisdom, the please go ahead with your I thoughts. Blame. Sorry, can I say, can I go ahead? All right, go ahead. Okay, so yes, there were benefits. And clearly, I mean, some of, some, uh, someone like me has been always been outspoken on these things. One of the things that post that 2018 IMF we did not continue to build was a resilient economy, economy that can stand shocks. Obviously, post 20, 20, 2018, we went into the market trying to have a certain program that the government wanted to do, not knowing that there was going to be a massive pandemic, which is COVID-19, which happened just two years after that, which basically threw the government program off, off work. So yes, clearly there were benefits, but those benefits were clearly eroded when we had the national, um, the international and the worldwide pandemic. Uh, wisdom, quick thoughts, quick thoughts on that. So I go into the next paper. Look, look when it comes to the Ga uh, Ghana's debt restructuring, right, and agreement with uh, uh, the euro bond holders to restructure our debt, uh, my thought is that I sincerely thought that it would have been uh, a heavy lift, right, to align and eventually unlock the next disbursement from uh, the IMF. Of course, we needed to make some good progress, Ben, in negotiations with uh, uh, the euro bond holders. But I was not overly hopeful in terms of pulling off a uh, proposed 40% uh, haircut on the bonds uh, with our euro bond lenders. But it's great to hear that we got a 37% haircut is awesome. So this is good progress. And it's an indication that we can possibly expect some improvement uh, in the economy. So all good stuff. But Ben, what we, we need to be mindful, right, how we celebrate this. The haircut is not really a saving from a, from a good management perspective. As the finance minister purportedly uh, described it, we are bankrupt. And our lenders decided to have mercy on us and forgive us uh, part of our debt. I wouldn't pop a champagne over this. We shouldn't be celebrating stuff like that. We should be sober and ask ourselves, how did we get here in the first place? How can we avoid this in the near future? And Ben, what I want to touch on briefly is that we like to say Ghana defaulted based on, uh, we gave excuses uh, because of impact of the, uh, the Ukrainian war, COVID-19, and also higher global interest rate. Look, that is true to some extent. But I also think that in Ghana, we have such a terrible risk management setup. Actually, no, as far as I know, the government doesn't have any meaningful risk uh, management setup in, in place to cushion us against some of these uh, uh, market impacts, you know, such as FX exposure and interest rate volatility. So when the finance minister was touting the savings achieved by the government in this restructuring, I think all he was saying is that our creditors have agreed to reduce our, our debt burden. We need to understand that it's not a savings achieved through you know, sound risk management, nor through any solid uh, debt management policy. We failed and we went bankrupt. And then we backed our creditors and they had mercy on us. That is not real savings here. The next phase of our challenge, Ben, where the rubber will meet the road, it's about to start, right? When we start to make interest and also principal payments on the debt that is uh, renegotiated, would we have the dollars to service the debt? I don't know. And that's why I think we are not yet out of the, uh, out of the woods, especially when it comes to stabilizing the city. We need to learn from these things and implement a proper risk management uh, strategy in place right. <clears throat> when it comes to our borrowing. Look, right. at some point, quickly, and, I, and I'll be done. At some point in my career with one of my uh, previous employers, I led strategic operations to issue debt uh, in the euro bond market. And when we were thinking through how to stand up the operations and also preparedness for 
uh, the issuers, some of our key considerations were not just the debt issuers, but also how do we have a comprehensive hedging strategy in place, you know? Putting in place strategies uh, uh, such as net investment hedge uh, designation for the translation risk, or leveraging a normal uh, fair value hedge program to mitigate our interest rate exposure. These are the key things you need in place when you start to raise you know, some of these external debt. And I was quite surprised that Ghana doesn't have some of these uh, comprehensive hedging strategies in place. Right. What that means is that you are at the mercy of the global shocks, right? Which can make it difficult for you to service our debt. So I think that is a great uh, milestone that we have achieved but we should really take a step back and ask ourselves, right. how did we get here and how can we prevent this uh, going forward? Daily Guide newspaper now, and I'll go inside before I come outside. Um, Kenya's Ruto agrees for conversation with protesters over uh, tax hikes. Kenya's Ruto agrees for conversation with protesters uh, over tax hikes. Um, I wish we could have more such uh, negotiations here on some of the taxes. Uh, we have to pay. Uh, over the weekend, I went somewhere, and trust me, um, the tax burden is huge. Um, intense phase of war with Hamas about to end. Benjamin Netanyahu uh, pictured there, of course. Hezbollah and uh, the myriad rockets it's been firing into Israel from Lebanon is also in uh, contention. And there's caution about whether there would be a, an escalation of that development. But getting into uh, the Daily Guide newspaper, NDC lies, deceits. Exposed. That's according to Godfrey Dame. And I'll not focus on the others because we practically touched on them. And I'm not going to go into the closed fishing, fishing season uh, beginning July the 1st. Uh, the it's, it's, it's already um, very clear. Uh, vigilantism laws to be enforced. So let me just go there, those two quick stories. Um, the Attorney General has been speaking at a town hall meeting with some Ghanaian residents in the UK. And he stated that the NDC's lies, deceptions and deceits had been ex exposed. We should resist all the lies, deception, and deceits of the NDC because that is their stock in trade. And I personally can attest to that. He then says their case has crumbled. And as the president will say, the case has fallen into water. Uh, that is Atonsuum. So indeed, we must resist the deception and lies of the NDC because they will come with all sorts of presentations about every major action or step being taken by this government. So we should be on uh, the lookout. My only reaction... Um, I'm a bit surprised about the Attorney General and some of these... Comments. By the way, I saw a video of some demonstrators. I don't know whether it's that place where he was having the town hall. I believe so, uh, which, which is pretty interesting in its own right. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, maybe you should leave the, leave the court of justice, the court of law, and uh, in a way, the court of public opinion uh, to make your case. I don't know about... And, and I, I, one surprise, though, the Ghana Bar Association, um, nothing said about this. I am curious because in other instances... Um, much more trivial. Uh, we've seen reactions. But anyway, who am I? Or as Chairman Woon to me will say, who am I? Anyway, uh, that's it. Then I'll just do the story in addition. Page six. Uh, so 2024 elections, vigilantism laws to be enforced. As Ghana approaches its presidential and parliamentary elections, it's a long winding bit, but yes, let's enforce the vigilantism uh, laws. But we all know that it will take more than just uh, rhetoric, word of mouth. The New Finder newspaper, $15 billion saved, uh, deferred, paves the way for resumption of stalled projects. I find it interesting when our finance ministers throw all of these things about, because if you go into it, and it's seminar awesome, but we don't have the time. Economic recovery on course, President Akufuado says, and of course he's, um, designated some new ambassadors to uh, different countries. And Nana Santi Bediato, his executive secretary, is now ambassador at large, which makes me wonder what happened to Dr. Mahama. Is he still ambassador at large? Do you remember? There's also only 4% of SDGs on track for Africa by 2030. That's according to the special advisor, which is what I was pointing to earlier. Out of 100%, only 4% on track. Woeful. Uh, quick thoughts, gentlemen, and we're out of here. I'll give you a minute each. Uh, Kojo, starting with you. 
Well, I don't think a minute is enough, Ben. A minute um, is what we have. A minute is what we have. Let me, let me say that, look, the, the stalled projects, and uh, when I saw the renegotiation concluded, uh, my heart jumped and I was very excited for our mothers and our sisters and our brothers in Kumasi. Finally, the, the KJTR market is going to start again. Your time is that ticking. Project has stalled. Sorry? Your time is ticking. Yes, but As I'm, you talk I'm, about I'm the market. It, so don't interrupt me, please. Um, the KJTR market is going to start again because that financing has stalled because of the renegotiation, because the funding is coming from Germany. So a good news for my people in Kumasi, you should know that that market will start as soon as possible. The issue of um, what you read, Ben, you held up a very big newspaper. And the biggest story on that front of that newspaper was the $1.5 billion that government is going to pay to people whose money have been stuck in defunct banks. And you didn't mention it. That is the biggest news of the day. The government, the same way we borrowed 2.24 billion Ghana cities and paid people who have mismanaged their money and put in banks that were not worth putting in. And government paid back those money to Ghanaians. Today, the government of Ghana, Nanado's government, MPP government, is going to pay 1.5 billion to Ghanaians whose money have been stuck. Um, they, do, they no longer have to go to Ministry of Finance to demonstrate every day. Now, one of the things that we should celebrate, and what my brother said was that the Ministry of Finance or the Minister of Finance was celebrating. No, he was celebrating that negotiation. They negotiated well. And he okay. admitted that we brought in 37% on the renegotiation on the interest or the haircut. Right. So that was what was being celebrated. Not necessarily that we want to go back into borrowing again. All right. Uh, Kweku Amua says, good morning, Ben. Watching live from Italy, you go on and on. This one says, when will the MPP stop blaming the NDC for its woes? Uh, wisdom, I'm sorry, but you have to be very brief so we, we, we get out of here. Our time is yeah, up. Ben, very brief. 40 seconds. I'm giving this. you 40 seconds, please. Let's go. Good, good. When it comes to this ambulance case, I'm not sure why the Attorney General is already concluding that the case at All right. I think it's a damning thing for his reputation that, one, right, the court found the tape recording as plausible evidence to admit in court. And secondly, the attorney general is not in good company of those in this kind of position that the court has advised to recuse from a case. But let me segue briefly uh, and, and talk about... Wisdom, you we know, don't have that much time. I'm sorry. We have to, we have to wrap it up. Final words. Just, just wrap up for me. I'm sorry. Look, what I would say is this, right? This matter should be adjudicated in the court of law. It's not a matter that should be adjudicated in, a, in a, a town hall or something of that nature. That, that matters in court, and they should respect the proceeding, okay. including the attorney general himself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Wisdom Dogbe. He is a finance analyst. He joined the conversation. Kodopoku is an energy analyst. He also joined uh, the conversation. Uh, before we get into sports, Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic helping us bring you this segment. They are offering you prostate screening for free if you're a man. Fertility screening for free if you're a woman. Reach out to them at any of their branches, starting with Accra, Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard, Kumasi Kronomuabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takwa Dianaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hansu and Esiaman Zima. You can reach them on 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic, the end to chronic disease. And just the start of sports in a few minutes. Do stay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to AM Sports here with me, Muftao Nabila Abdullah. Ghana is four by 100 meters relay teams. That was the men and women. They have won gold and silver, respectively, in the ongoing African Athletics Senior Championships in Douala. The men's won their, um, their race by a time of 38.63 seconds, while the women did 43.63 seconds.
Toby Musan anchored for Nigeria was her holiday date for Ghana. And since 2018, Nigeria has never lost the women's 4 by 100 meters relay. Now, let's take a look at the highlights of how Rose Yebua won gold for Ghana in the women's high jump with a leap of 1.87 meters. Amoniwa Rose Yeboa qui va se lancer. Et c'est parti Elle est passée la galine Yeboa Observez ici la course, l'appui d'un seul pied et le saut costal. Tac Cette fois-ci, elle a su relever ses talons pour réussir donc à se coucher sur la mousse juste après. Rouge Bois, Ghana's first female ever to secure a ticket to the Olympic Games after she was able to clear a height of 1.97 meters. So she'll be going to the uh, Paris Olympic Games later this summer. Let's do football where the fans of Samatex are calling on government to construct their rules ahead of the calf Champions League. According to them, CAF will only grant them license to be able to host CAF Champions League matches if the rules are fixed. The deplorable state of the road leading to the main township of Samraboy, the home of reigning Premier League champions FC Samatex, remains a significant issue that affects many. Potholes, uneven surfaces, and frequent washouts characterize the road, making it a treacherous journey for anyone who must traverse it. During the raining season, the road becomes particularly hazardous, with muddy stretches and large pools of water causing delays and sometimes even rendering it impassable. Despite repeated promises by successive government to fix the road, no substantial progress has been made, leaving fans of the club and community members increasingly frustrated. If you are cooking, Masia, you bread papa, you better to put us in say a bebani ayare, and so your shed was a mem ha, coo, and near my drian in your menina if you was a neighbor. And so I buy you, we are a bamba or Jans and may a crime may a crime or copper, and he has seen him. Next, I say, a person said the premier. In the Bedi Premier, to also be a tenant of Kwanya. About some of the war, Tamale, Sunyani, Benin, or more difficulties in the transportation, and never come up for no. Almost all my Bedi has no more bread. And perhaps I know Chris, I hope a few Tamale will do some more bread. No more bread. By any sense, we see any atram and Akuka. In the Tumuko Basa, any Tambia, in the Bessle, the Bessle. Africa, Capo, never see a bona boy. It's just some Munya Kwana Mayana. Omoya Kwana Maya. Join news, we are everywhere. So we will plead on behalf of our leaders to also support us in the our road system. That is very poor for us. FC Summertex head coach Nuri Namadu shares in the sentiment of the fans. He believes that repairing the road will not only reduce the burden on traveling teams, but also will eliminate one of the key excuses by traveling teams for poor performances at the Century Sports Arena. I hope that with, with this trophy, with this championship, with this victory, as a young club, the powers that be should see to it that at least uh, the road is start and then we, it can facilitate movement and then uh, when clubs are coming here, uh, they don't complain. In fact, we every two weeks we move out 
but every team will come here only once in, in the season. So we, are, we, we suffer a lot. Now, for the people of Samara Boy, despite the fun and pride that FC Samatex brings to them by hosting games in the top flight in their town, it is not enough to heal them of the challenges that come with this road. For them, they humble pleas for government to come to their aid, to fix this road, to make not just their journeys to and fro town easy, but also for fans and other football clubs coming to play their favorite club here to make their journeys easier. And more importantly, to make it even more easy for them to be able to host the CAF Champions League games at their favorite sports stadium. Because fixing this road will go a long way to them getting the approval to host those games. Reporting for Joy Sports at Samra Boy, Uzbar Razak. To the Backers League now, and uh, this year's edition is scheduled to start on July 20. Joy Sports will partner in the Bankers League and bring you everything you need to know about this competition. And uh, we have been interacting with some of the bank, uh, National Investment Bank, Consolidated Bank Ghana, and Republic Bank. And they've all been speaking about how they are ready for this year's competition. Competition is the fifth edition of the Bankers League, and it is expected to have about 12 teams participating. Prince Charles Kosanko, the coordinator for the league, describes this year's event as a special one. We have nine banks that have confirmed to us. And you know, this year we are having a series of tournaments this year. We have all done, we've done it one package. We are having a gala that is coming on first on the uh, 6th of July. Then the league starts uh, 27th July and then we'll have the Champions Cup in November. So this year is uh, three tournaments. In, in a full season that we are playing together. So as of now, with the gala, we have nine banks which have confirmed. We are waiting for, I think, three or four more to give us confirmation. So we are expecting about 12 banks for this season. National Investment Bank, defending champions of the competition, will win it again, according to Kweku Gansa, assistant captain of the team. Actually, honestly, we don't actually train. We've played as a unit for a long time, so we just go there put out the performance and win. It's that easy. We are the Real Madrid of Bankers League. It's not that like we are boasting. We are the Real Madrid of Bankers League, so it's, it's natural. We are having the talent. I've taken the goal king for on two occasions, so, you know, we'll meet them. Also, Shadrach Lomote echoed the position of his captain. Yeah, just as uh, my colleague has said, as National Investment Bank, Investors FC, we are ready for all other banks especially Republic Bank, and we want to assure them that this time around, we are keeping the cup. The cup is not leaving NIB. Um, they should get ready, and we'll meet on the field, as my, my team captain has said. So I wish all the other teams the best of luck, but kudos to National Investment Bank. The team manager of Republic Bank, Fris Ni Mate, says they are out to claim the trophy from the National Investment Bank, while his captain, Gerald Kwanza, promised to match the might of NIB. We, we are more than ready. It's, even we're having this interview at the uh, Rainy Champions uh, place of work. That shows how ready we are. When we told them that this year the competition is for us, we are more than ready. We are, we are not threatened. Um, in fact, we are actually, as he said, he's, he's been the best striker. I'm also the best defender. So on that day, if we meet, we are going to show him that Yes, we, are, we came really prepared for him. And as a local, there's a local palace, we say that I've grown it from. So we'll not talk too much. He's, he's, he said a lot. He said it's been that easy. He said it's been that easy. So don't worry. I won't talk much. We'll meet on the field and we'll show him what we've got. Also, for Consolidated Bank, the team manager, Benjamin Hooper, and his deputy are optimistic their team will be ready to take on the best in this year's competition. G has started training. Last year we were third. Two years ago we were third. Last year we won the best goalkeeper. We had the team with the least number of conceded goals. So this year we expect that we'll improve on our performance. Yeah, I think, you know, last uh, the last slot we have for last year, I think uh, we did not we perform well, but not up to expectation. 
this time around we've come fully prepared as my colleague said we have started training seriously towards this exercise so what should we expect we are winning the trophy this year i can bet you we are seriously planning and we are working towards winning this year is for cbg the bankers league will be launched on july 6 with balloting of teams shadowed for July 13. The league itself will start on July 20 and end on November 2, Welcome back on the AM show. Earlier this morning, I mentioned that we have an exclusive interview coming your way this morning. And this is that interview. In the studio with me this morning is the office, the Registrar of Companies, formerly the Registrar General, um, Madam Jemima Wari, former Registrar General and now Registrar of Companies, and a member of the Ghana Bar Association, as well as the Federation of International Women Lawyers Association, that is FIDA. Welcome to the program, Madam Thank Jemima. Thank you. So nearly two years since the Office of Registration of Company, Registrar of Companies took over from some responsibilities from the Registrar General's Department. How has that been for you so far? Well, I must say that I was Registrar General since 2017 till when I took over the new role as Registrar of Companies in 2029. Sorry, 2019. Okay. Now, the act was passed in 2019. That's the Companies Act. Right. And uh, the law specifically stated that you cannot be the Registrar General as well as the Registrar of Companies. Mm. So I had to put down my position as Registrar General. Okay. And then take on the new role as the Registrar of Companies. So I must say that being a very new organization, I mean, very, very new having to operationalize it right from the very beginning. It has been challenging as well as very exciting because as Registrar General, I had more responsibilities. Okay. I had to oversee the registration of companies as well as marriages, industrial property rights. Mm. Uh, I was the Administrator General, administering estates. Um, I also also the official liquidator, uh, liquidating companies that were going defunct and not able to pay their debts as it fell due. Right. Now all that is now going to be left uh, with the Registrar General. We now have a new Registrar General okay. in the that? person of Mrs. Grace Isahak. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So she would concentrate on the registration of industrial property rights marriages and administration of estates. Okay. So that is the hive of, the act specifically hived of the office of the Registry of Companies to focus on businesses. What are the key differences in the functions? I yes. mean, aside registration of businesses, that's the ORC for short, that is the office of the Registry of yes. Companies, yes. has taken over from the Registrar General's Department. What are the key differences in your functions when it comes to this transition of responsibilities? So for now, we only focus on businesses. Just businesses. Businesses. In addition, we are also the regulator of insolvency practitioners. Right. And so, I mean, if I'm talking of businesses, it's not just, I'm sure you are just thinking of maybe one man business. There's so many things under businesses. I'm talking of companies. State institutions are in there. No, okay. no. They are set up by acts of parliament. Okay. So I'm talking of companies. You hear of limited liability companies, yes. public or private, and limited liability companies, external companies. Companies limited by guarantee, such as churches, mm. CSOs, clubs, associations. Those are all to do with companies. Then we talk of business names, one-man business, sole proprietors. They are also there. Subsidiary business names. Now, you know Joy FM is a subsidiary business name. Yeah. You know that? Yeah, you're a subsidiary business name. So your parent company is multimedia. Mm. Uh -huh. So that's so we oversee all such type of registrations. Not only that, 
We also regulate and register professional bodies, such as um, the Ghana Bar Association, um, the Chartered Institute of, you know, the, all these chartered yeah. institutes, Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, they've left the professional bodies, but there are quite over 90 professional bodies on our register. Okay. Not only that, uh, we are still the regulator of insolvency practitioners. Yeah. Insolvency has now come into the, the free. Initially, it was just liquidation, but now we regulate and license insolvency practitioners. We also carry out public education and sensitization of our processes, as this program is allowing me to do. Yeah. So you inform people about it. We appoint inspectors and receivers, you know, so that now you can see we are more skewed towards the business sector. And then most importantly, this data that we generate, we share to um, the general public, to clients, to banks, insurance companies, yeah. We'll get into the various nitty gritties of your role as liquidator and solvency, but yes. let's focus on marriage for a little bit before we... Marriage? Yeah, I'm, we, I want clarification okay. on that because now, uh, you know, the registration of marriages has traditionally um, been, you know, managed by registrars under the Metropolitan and Municipal Assemblies. Yes. Now the responsibility is centralized and under the Registrar General's Department. Yes. What does that mean for those who you know, are interested in that department in terms okay. of cost, in terms of processes, and everything in between. What's changed? That's lovely. <laughs> Bringing in my old rule. Yeah. Okay. So now uh, we are the principal registrar of marriages. What that means is that metropolitan assemblies and district assemblies, everything that goes on there, we are the principal registrar of marriages. Orthodox churches, charismatic churches, whoever carries on marriages in Ghana, we oversee all that. Okay. Now, in the past, you know, they should have been submitting returns to us. Mm -hmm. And they weren't. But now it's changing. Um, there is a new software being developed by the department. And every marriage that takes place in Ghana would have to be captured on this software. Okay. Yes. What that means is that there are very specific requirements that you need to have before you have a valid ordinance marriage, what which unfortunately, many people do not know. Okay. Most churches have to be licensed to register marriages, and they are not. Okay. The men of God have to be gazetted as marriage officers. Many of them are not. You need one type of license, either a registrar certificate, which is normally issued by the Metropolitan Assemblies, or the special license which the Registrar General Department issues, or the church. The church has forms they're supposed to complete to issue a license known as the marriage officer's license. But unfortunately, they don't. Sometimes you find marriages being you know, conducted or officiated in gardens, in hotels. Yeah. Those places are not licensed. Does that mean those marriages are... Are void. Okay. Unfortunately, they are void. I mean, many marriages in Ghana are void. I have to, yes, because if they don't follow, it's very strict. The ordinance marriage is very strict. Mm. The premises has to be licensed. Sometimes, let's say the main church is licensed, and they think that the branches, therefore, can take the legality from the main church. No. Even the branches have to be licensed. Okay. Yes. So if your main mm. church is licensed for marriages... Mm -hmm. and the branch is not licensed, that marriage is void. The public don't know this. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. So many, many, so you can right. go ahead, you have a lot of um, paper, paper, marriage, but the premises is not licensed. The minister has to be gazetted by us. All ministers of religion have to be gazetted by the Registrar General through the Minister of Justice to be marriage officers. So if your marriage falls under this category of marriages that you're calling void now, what do you do to ensure that? You have to do it again and make sure that it complies. Okay. So you have to come back to the registration as department, possibly do it under a special license. And the special license is only issued okay. by the Registrar General. And the Registrar General, at your function, under a special license, with the register of marriages, the, the booklet, gives validity to the premises, if even it's not licensed. 
That's how come you can find us going to the hotels and to the beaches and wherever on the face of Ghana, hospitals, wherever. It's a special license. It does away with the 21-day notice okay. and you can carry on a valid marriage in such an instance. Okay. Another thing, you cannot marry a woman if you are already under an ordinance marriage, you cannot go and register um, a customary law marriage with another woman. Even if you have three or four women who you are married under customary law, you cannot marry one out of them unless you divorce all the others. Okay. So I think that we have to maybe do more, more. education, yes. public education yes, so yes. people... Um, understand how all of this works. Yeah. Now let's focus on your role as, um, first, as let's talk about your role as regulator of insolvency for clarity. What is the mandate of, you know, the regulator of insolvency for the office of the, um, not only for the practitioners, but I mean, it means that if a company is in financial crisis and they, it's decided that they need to either restructure their debt to ensure that they're paying off their debtors or in worst case scenario, wind it up. It means that you come in and uh, oversee such processes. Is that correct? To some extent. Okay. Please in, shed, let, let's, let's get yes. into that. Mm -hmm. In the past, you know, it was just official liquidation okay. under the Bodies Corporate Official Liquidations Act. And then I was then the official liquidator. And that's how come we're able to liquidate, I'm sure you heard of it, almost all these fund management companies yes. and the DKMs and all that. Yes, because, yes. Enough, yeah. At that time, we didn't have this new legislation in place, the Corporate Insolvency mm -hmm. Restructuring Act, 2020, Act 1015, as well as this amendment, right. Act 1031. Mm -hmm. Now, this legislation allows us to now bring in a rescue culture into the whole plane, such that we now bring on professionals in addition to the official liquidator. These professionals are chartered accountants, right. bankers, lawyers, who would normally be registered by the uh, Ghana Association of Restructuring Insolvency Advisors. You've heard of them, Garia? Mm -hmm. Garia normally registers such professionals. Now, they take on that intermediary role now of trying to rescue these companies that are going through distress, okay. either through administration or restructuring. And that's where we come in. Okay. And so Garia would train them, and they would be brought over to us, and we would also go over their records and qualifications and everything, and license them as insolvency practitioners. So in that space, they would now ensure that companies that are going through distress are not liquidated by the official right. liquidator straight away. Okay. Yes. So creditors can appoint such professionals. The courts can appoint such professionals. And the registrar can also appoint such insolvency practitioners. And so they would help either... The is more of a supervisory... Yes, role. yes, okay. yes, yes, hmm. yes, yes. They would help by either ensuring they get more funding to sort of bring these companies that are going down back, you know, back up. And of course, you stay off all debtors and creditors mm. because you're going through a period of restructuring and either through administration or whatever means just to bring it back, changing maybe the top management and making sure that the company works again. But if all that fails, mm -hmm then official liquidation gets in. And even then, the insolvency practitioner can also now do official liquidation. And most companies still will come back to the official liquidator, that is uh, us, maybe because we've been in the fray for so long. Mm -hmm. But the point is currently, we are not the only ones that can do official liquidation. Does this apply to state institutions? Precisely. So, so state, state institutions will come to the official, the government official liquidator. Okay. to be liquidated, yes. So for clarity, let's say this um, ongoing SNIT issue, right? Where does the ORC come in? You know, if it was decided that these SNIT hotels, for example, um, needed to be winded up because they're in financial crisis and it has been decided through whatever processes need to be for that decision to be made, where does the ORC come in? You would be the ones overseeing 
the processes? Or it's not there? automatic. Okay, so whoever are the creditors mm -hmm. of the, the, the hotels or the shareholders, whoever, or the contributors, whoever like, or capital is at stake there, mm -hmm. Who would want the company, you know, liquidated? Would have to appoint, you know, appoint us, yes, right. or go to the courts mm. to get the appointment made. So it's not automatic. Okay, it's not automatic. And with what is happening now, I mean, with the new act, the government might appoint us, or the government might also appoint an insolvency practitioner. Okay. In the past, it was only the official liquidator. Okay, but now it's not like that. As I said. But at the end of the day, we oversee that whole process. We license uh, these insolvency practitioners. They are supposed to renew their licenses on a yearly basis. I've given them up to June 30th. If they don't come and renew, we'll take their names off. Okay. They have to file reports. You know, it's, it's a regulator. You have to regulate whatever practice they are carrying on out there. So that is the role of the um, official liquidator as well as the register of companies okay okay um let's talk about your role as a lick we just talked about the insolvency and liquidity yes now yes so let's talk about registration of companies i said last year you were given some five hundred thousand companies um some deadlines to come and re-register their companies how is that faring have you taken their names off the no, books or they no. actually came to um, <laughs> do what's right so let me set the record straight. The 500,000 um, number I mentioned mm -hmm. is for business names. Okay. It's for business names such as sole proprietors. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, in fact, they have responded very positively. Okay. It's still not good enough. Of the 500,000, I can tell you just about 5,000 have renewed their business names. That's Yes, Not that's encouraging. at all. <laughs> okay. Now, the business names lifeline really is just yearly. And I think many of them didn't really know. The act specifically states that you renew on a yearly basis. If you don't renew, it lapses. So all these business names I'm talking about have actually lapsed. But the prerogative to keep them on the register is that of the registrar. And we have all these years just kept them on, and so they never really bothered to come and renew. But that kind of prerogative is coming to an end. You can't have a name operating all these number of years. I'm talking of going as far back as 1963, and you're just doing business and not bothering to renew it. Not bothering to, because you see, we keep that name on the register to ensure that nobody else picks up that name. And you are not renewing it, and the law says it's lapsed. So we'll go ahead and carry out what we said we'll do. So we've given them an opportunity again. You can, you can renew that business name either by uh, the star 222 hash. We put that one out. It's just 60 Ghana cities to renew a business name. Okay. I heard yesterday that some, of, some officers around my office were informing them that it's 200 Ghana cities. No. It's just 60 Ghana cities to renew a business name. There are also charlatans going around in the name of officers from my office. They claim they are auditors. The agency. Agency. Or, we, don't, okay. we don't know them. Okay. They give you, don't you know them. No. They give you a Momo number. We don't have a Momo number. So I'm putting this on record. If anybody comes to you saying they are coming from our office, from the accounting department or legal department with a Momo number, no, they are fraudsters. Okay. Do not pay any money. And it's surprising. You know, they would rather pay to them than pay to us. Oh, oh yes, yes. I don't know why they get scared. Because they think it's quicker for them to... No, but they scare them and tell them that we're going to take your name off this afternoon. And you find them paying monies to... Instead of coming to our office, which is very legal, you go to... There's a bank there. You can pay at the bank yourself. Or you can pay on star 222 hash. Right. So aside um, putting information, information like this on websites, in newspapers, coming yes. on shows like yes. this, yes. is there an, any other sort of way of communicating these things to businesses? Like, do you send them text messages on their numbers? How do you communicate to ensure that they're actually receiving the message? In fact, that is what we did. 
that brought them all running to our office. Okay. So we sent them an SMS, giving them a deadline mm. that if they didn't come and renew by a particular time, we'll take their names off. And you should see the office, it's so full now. Why do you have to wait for an SMS to be sent to you? When we've made it very clear that a business name is valid only for a year. So you should know that before the year ends, you quickly come and renew. Okay. So, so that is, that, that is information that they should know by now, okay. yes. So the ORC is still operating within the offices of the RGD, Registrar General's Department? Yes, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in that sense, yes. At least we have somewhere to operate from, but it's affecting the brand. Did, you, did they create um, new workstations, bring in new personnel to accommodate the new responsibilities? Or how is that working? Okay. So as soon as the president operationalized that office, we were able to come up with strategy documents and an organizational manual. Out of the strategy documents, we have started interviews, but we started internally first because our work is quite specialized. It's not the normal yeah. company registration is quite specialized. Mm. So of course we're doing the internal recruitment. If that is completed and there are still you know, positions that have not been filled up on the organization manual, we'll do the external recruitment. Even then, it has to be from the public service mm. because um, the act specifically states we cannot use our internally generated funds to pay for salaries. So it has why, to be why, from, why that is what it said. It has to be from the public service where you already have an employment in the public service and being paid by government. Maybe that was allowed to enable us to complete our own building because we have to construct our own building and move out of the Registrar General's Department. So we have been able to procure land in Lagon. Mm. It's behind the Golf House, okay. um, 2.1 acres land, and we are in the process of um, completing the process to put up our own office, office yeah. modern office for the <laughs> office of the Registrar of Companies, okay. yes. And when that happens, will move out of the Registrar General's Department. Okay. I wanted us to talk about um, something before you mentioned the internally generated funds. And something, when I was reading the updated final report, some presentation that you made, something caught my eye that I want clarification on. Now, the ORC has financial autonomy. Yes. It means that it operates its finances independently. At the same time, or in addition, it manages the finances of the Registrar General's Department. Is that correct? No. Okay, how does that work? No, we okay, have... Let, let, me, let me add the last bit of the issues and then we can yeah. um, unpack all of it. Yeah. In the instance that the ORC cannot acquire an immovable property, it can bring in some assistance. But who pays for that um, extra help to acquire that immovable property? Property. We have to pay it out of our internally generated funds. Okay, not from the off, um, coffers of the Registrar General. General. No, so now we, ha we are separate institutions now. Registrar General's Department has its own funds, it has its own budget, has its own internally generated funds. Managed by the URC? No, managed by the Registrar General. Okay. It's a separate institution now. Mm -hmm. Now the Office of Registrar of Companies is a separate institution now having its own internally generated funds, and governed now by a governing board. We have an 11-member governing board that governs operations with, with our committees. And so it's a separate institution. So our own IGF funds are what are going to be used to run the operations of our office, as well as helping us to construct the new premises, yes, yes. and then move out of the Registrar General's Department. So this confusion of, you know, we, we are separate, separate, separate institutions with different heads, so with different functions. Money, you know, with, no, 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 it's no, no way, no, at all no, no, the no, no, it's now completely hived off, yes. <laughs> okay, let's talk about some things that businesses and individuals will be interested in right now. Um, yes. Can you run us through the basic processes of registering an entity now? Okay. Now, for instance, every entity must have some... First of all, you must even know which type of entity you want to register before you even begin. You remember I was mentioning quite a number of them, yes. 
So you must know the entity type. And I'll, I'll put in this word, people just get up and say, I want to register a company. Now, the company is a very serious business. So if you're not ready for it, don't register it. Mm -hmm. Yes, because you need directors, you need auditors, you need a secretary, you need a registered office, you need books, you must maintain books, you need an auditor who will be charging you quite a bit mm -hmm. to put your financial statements together. You know, if you're not ready, don't, don't go for it. That's for big companies. Uh, I mean, yes, I believe that you can even have a small company, but you must, you must be ready to comply with the conditions in the Act. Mm -hmm. So that is how come I have over 300,000 companies on the register, and maybe only about 100,000 are active. That's, you see what I mean? That's 200,000 inactive. In fact, it's even more than that. If I go back to 1963... When you know, you know, when we, we hadn't automated, that's the historical, historical database of businesses of which your company was one. <laughs> historical, I'm talking of really, really yeah. old time companies. Many of them haven't done what we call re registration, that is, updating us with the current information on those companies. What they are still using old certificates. Mm. They haven't bothered to file their annual returns. They haven't bothered to file their financial statements. All their directors need unique tax identification numbers. They haven't bothered to do that. So we can't search on them electronically. Though they are about 300,000 sitting in the historical database. What can you do about it? Yes, so we are going to start. Right now, I'm concentrating on those that are in the e registrar. I mean, since 2011, we automated. Those are the sample of about 8,000 companies I, I spoke of. Yes, we have made a bit of noise. About 7,000 now will be taken off the register from next month. Okay. Yes, because we've done everything we need to do. Some have come, some haven't. Okay. So you definitely need to know the type of company you want to register. Okay. Fine. So it's a company, then be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And you have different types. You need a name. You need, uh, and the name to will do a search to make sure that you don't have somebody's name. Mm -hmm. You need objects, of course, or an activity or a sector you want to operate in. Mm -hmm. You need um, a registered office and a principal place of business. Mm -hmm. You need directors. You need a secretary. You need auditors. And so for a company like that, at least you need a minimum of two directors and a minimum of one shareholder. And uh, now the laws are that you need to make sure that if you have an auditor, after six years, you change the auditor. That's the yes, law. Yes, I saw that directive um, yes. some time ago. About you need that. You need to appoint new auditors. Yes. Mm -hmm. You need beneficial owners. Mm -hmm. you, know that, you know about beneficial owners as well? Yeah. Those, the real ultimate owners behind a company, yeah. you need that kind of information. The ending of your company name now has to change. Many old companies still have limited LTD. li it has to yeah. be ltd or plc or all those things you have to do that so that is for a company but for a business name it's just a very simple process you need a name you need the objects you need a place where you do business from that's it you need your mobile numbers email but for now every business needs at least a digital address you need to come to us with your digital address you need um a unique identifier the national Identification Authority mm. Card Number. Yes. So these are some of the things you need at least to register a company, whether a guarantee company, even a professional body. You need to have a name. You need to have objects. You need to have members, whoever you want to be your members. For the professional bodies, at least you must have at least 50 members before we can register you as a professional body. So there are, these are the, yeah. the differences. There are young people these days who, you know, in various trades and they're yes. calling them organizing they're calling themselves ceos and really oh yeah you know you go on instagram and facebook a lot of people say ceo of this and that venture and they're selling you know one or two things um what is the proper regulations when it comes to those small small companies by young people not people who want to register limited you know liabilities and all that for example if my little sister sells wigs on social media what is compliance doing with all of that? Okay, so she has to possibly register a business name. 
She doesn't want a complicated business, isn't it? Yeah. She's the sole owner. That's the business name, sole proprietor. Sole proprietor. But she must renew it on a yearly basis. That's about it. That's the thing. I told and you. And all she needs is a business name. Yes. And she doesn't need to um, mm -hmm. uh, have, what, have books and all those things that yeah. the company would require. Okay. But she has to renew it on a yearly basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. She can call herself the CEO. She's the chief. <laughs> Chief executive, but normally I'd have you CEO for a company. Yeah. Yes, but the, the key thing is to keep it valid on our register, you must renew it yearly. That's it. And if she doesn't, because there are a lot of these businesses then it that are not registered. Then it lapses. Okay, those no, that are not registered. Not system at all. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yes. So then they are going against the law because, you see, well, you can, she can do a business in her own name. What's your sister's name? No, this is hypothetical. Okay, but give yeah. me a name. So. Uh, Sweetie. Sweetie no. Abochi. Angela. Okay, so Angela, my little sister is Okay, say so Angela Abochi. Yes. You can do business in the name Angela Abochi without adding anything to it. It's allowed. Okay. But if you go to any bank, they will not accept that. Okay. They would require a document to identify you, to be able to, you know, for corporate governance purposes, to check on you from the system, to make sure that you are really who you say you are. So then you are compelled to then register. So it's not a crime, but you will encounter some um, hindrances on Definitely. your way of Definitely. growing or expanding Definitely. your business. You're going anywhere for a facility. Nobody is going to give you a facility in your own name. Okay. You need a legal identity. So it's either a business name or a partnership. We register partnerships as well. You know, partnerships is between 2 to 20 people can also register a partnership. And they will be governed by a partnership agreement. They don't have to also have a secretary or auditors, you know, and all those books. So pos possibly people could register partnerships instead of companies. Right. But everybody just talks of, I want to register a company. And then they don't bother to file returns. And it just sits on our database. You know? In this day and age that we're encouraging entrepreneurship and innovation, is there anything that the office or the Registrar General's Department, both offices, are, although that's not your <laughs> office anymore, is there anything that you're doing to maybe assist these young people who want to register a wig company, I mean, do business in their own names as sole proprietors and all that? Is there any sort of arrangement that you know, is skewed towards assisting them to be more regulated in a way? Hmm. Maybe we should uh, be talking about the new software that we want to deploy okay. to What's make it very easy hmm. for them to register their businesses wherever they are. We currently, huh? yes, we hmm. currently have um, a software that we have migrated onto the government cloud at NITA, yes, um, but it's not fully digital as many people would wish it to be. The government because, cloud. Yeah, we are on the government cloud now. It's made our, our services better than it was before because initially you keep on hearing of downtimes and all that. It's, it's, it's come down considerably. So with the new software that we intend to deploy, fully digital, wherever you are, you can register online. Mm -hmm. You can pay online. You can get your certificates online without necessarily walking into our offices. Okay. We are hoping to deploy this software by the end of this year. And um, I'm talking of everything digital. You know, currently, you have to download forms, fill it, scan it, before we examine it and approve it. But what I'm talking of, you don't need to do that anymore. You fill in everything online mm. and pay online. You we have been coming up with the software on your own mobile phone. Mm. You, can, you, can, you can register your business on your phone that, that's going to be very exciting yeah. pay online do everything online yes so with that sort of um facility your sister could easily uh get a service provided here from the orc yeah but currently we are also giving you 24-hour service from our prestige center okay you didn't know we had a prestige no. center we do <laughs> okay. we have a prestige center now within 24 hours when you come in there you get your certificates registered and your company registered your certificates and everything that you need within 24 hours. And so, that eliminates those um, agencies yes, that are causing yes, all that yes. drama. You just pay a little bit more, of course. Okay. I mean, prestige. Prestige, so you pay yes. A bit more. But definitely you get a service rendered you within 24 hours. Yeah. Okay. So just to reiterate, it is not a crime to do business in your own name. But what else could you know, constitute some sort of criminal act or conduct 
in the process of starting a business, operating a business, registering or not registering? A, is there any criminality in there should someone decide that they do not want to actually register their company? Yeah, it's a criminal offense if you're, if you're operating a business, not in your own name. Not in your own name. Yes, That's but criminal. with, say, yes, with a, you, you can say Sweetie, Sweetie Edumwa Ventures. Or even if you don't have the ventures, but consult, investment, realty, something. And you're doing business out there and you're not registered. It's criminal. The law is against that. Okay. Yes. I thought you said that you can do business in your name. Yes, but I said you can't proprietor. add. Okay. You can't add oh, so something. So you can't to... add those yes. like, consultancy. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes, right. yes, okay. yes. Okay. So if it's just Sweetie Edumwa, that's, that's the business you are registering. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to come against you. But and nobody... in that case, the only hindrance is if you need bank transaction. Or even going to the, for a visa or a contract. Yeah. Nobody's going to sign that with okay. you. Okay. Yes. So don't add all these um, if, yeah, entities if that's what you or want. qualifications to the names that you want to do business If that's in. what you want, yes. Okay. But there will be disadvantages, I okay. bet you. <laughs> all right. So um, in terms of the warnings of closing down these entities who fail to comply with your rules of engagement, um, what, where do we stand right now? Hmm. You are here. So what is your so, message to them? So, well, I, I'm not that interested in striking down companies and okay. closing down. I'm more interested in companies complying for us to get um, the current information on them. I mean, think about it. You start off a business, you start off with your directors and your shareholders, and along the way, some of them die or some of them leave. And yet in our register, we have in there all these ghost names. Ghost names. Yeah. Uh, it's not right. You've moved. You, you started from, say, Kokumemli. You are now in a Kantamanto or somewhere like that. And we come and check the register, and it's still the same old address. So when we talk of filing of annual returns and final financial statements, it's just for you to update us with the most current information. Mm -hmm. So we have talked for quite a bit. It's getting to two years now, and they are not taking us serious. So by the end of this month... This month? Yes, 30th June. We gave up to 30th June. Mm. So from 1st July, we have names already on our website. We informed all companies that were interested and remaining on the register to go to the website, check if their names are there and they are still interested in doing business in Ghana, then they should update us. So all those names that we would do, a, we'll, of course, we'll do a, a run of the companies again. And all those that haven't complied, then we'll take the steps of striking their names off the register. Now, once we strike you off the register, you cannot use that name within the next 12 years unless you go to the courts and get them to order us to reinstate it. And even then, it's at the court's discretion. Once you take your names off, we will inform all banks. Yes, we will inform all banks about it. If in case you are operating an account, we will let them know that you are no more in our books. Because if you are not careful, they will continue to do yeah. business when they are not on the register, and which is, which which is, is also, also not good. Mm -hmm. So we will tell all business or government institutions that you do not sign any contract with any company unless you run a check. Do okay. a due diligence on our register to check okay. if the company is even still on our register. Okay, I think the most, the um, one challenge that's come out in our conversation so far, that will be impact on businesses in terms of decoupling the ORC from the RGD is access to information. Now, aside that, what other um, impact is this having on businesses? Or, for example, are there any upcoming legislative or policy changes that businesses should be aware of in relation to the ORC's function now? We have put it all out there already. I don't know why you say access to... Information. information. It's all there. Okay. What I mean is, there are some people who might not know that in terms of registration of businesses and all the other um, responsibilities that have been transferred from the RGD or to the URC, that's yeah. access to information oh, or okay. getting to know that something like this has happened. So that's an impact on their business. If you don't know, then you don't know where to go, what to do. And you might just be committing a crime without even knowing. <laughs> so aside that, what other impact is this decoupling of these two offices having on businesses? 
I think it's been quite minimal. Okay. Especially because we are still in the same premises. Okay. And um, we are carrying out quite a bit of public education and sensitization. Mm. We, you know, recently we even sent out our company inspectors to go around okay. into the um, various business districts. Also, something we discovered. Tell me. This company, is it Chocolate Supreme or something? Mm. You see, the company name is Exists, but they have branded their business with a different name entirely. That is not registered. We discovered quite a lot of that. Every, every company name that you put on your register mm. must be the same name you put on your premises. So you find out that the name on the certificate is different from what they are trading in. It's, okay. it's against the law. We realize that they are more excited putting up AMS uh, business no, operating permit yeah. mm. than the document that gives them legality, which is the business register, the company certificate. That certificate that's you yes, that is what you. gives you life, and the law requires you to put it up, you know, in your office. So you can't have a name on the certificate, and yet you you're trading as a different name without registering it somebody can be given that very same name. We found that one out. Okay. Many of them didn't have books. I'm talking of books. Every company requires books. The books should be books on who your members are. They find our office as their book. <laughs> so when they change shareholders, they run to our office to come and change. That should not be the case. You should carry on those changes in your office mm. and update us on that later on. So I'm just trying to say that it's not that different. We have put out a lot of education out there. Our officers are out there. We are still in the same premises. Okay. So, so minimal impact. Yes. It's your duty to comply by filing your returns and updating us. It's, I don't see the fact that we've moved, you know, making it so difficult. Because that means in the past, they were never filing any returns anyway. But those... Those who were consistent and filing returns, when they come, we are still there. Okay. And we will still give you the service that you require. We are um, going to have to wrap up soon. But I want to find out, what's your vision, say, for the next five years as the Office of the Register of Companies now? What do you intend to achieve with this outfit in the next five, ten years? Okay, it's, it's my vision, really, to be like a world-class registry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is what I want it to be, not okay. what we currently are. Okay. Um, Customer-oriented, innovative, given a, a service that is so seamless, easy, makes life very easy for our various clients, giving you a very healthy business environment, and also having quality data. That is why I keep on insisting on, you know, so that you can yeah. rely, you can rely on the data mm. that we have, you know, in our register. Okay. So that is my vision. So that you should come to ORC knowing that we will pamper you. Mm. Life will be easier for you. You're going to have a problem filing your returns yeah. and all that. Let me add another thing. With this new software that is coming. Yeah. We are going to be digitizing even the financial statements. Okay. There is going to be an XBRL format okay. of filing financial statements. That is a new way of also doing business. Electronically, you are not going to be scanning you know, financial statements into our system. No, you key in your financials. So we can be able so to get details that you just key in. Yes, and pull fantastic, up that fantastic. You need for you to... So we can pull out statistical reports from those figures. Okay. That's a very new, and yeah. we have to start the education for all our auditing firms. That what they've been used to in the past, just putting up these simple financial set, mm. no, it's going to change. All right. We have to do things along the line of what all business registries are doing worldwide. You remember what I said? World class. Yes. World, World class. class ORC, ORC for Ghana. Yes, that is okay. what I'm looking for. I, I will give you the chance to um, share your final thoughts, and if we've left anything else, you can touch on that. But another interesting that caught my eye in this presentation, and in the formation of this 11-member board, 
it doesn't say anything about who appoints who, but when it comes to two female lawyers with expertise in corporate law, practice, blah, 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 it specifically says that they should be nominated by the presidency. I thought that was very specific. Yes. Okay, Why is so, that? Well, this is what the law said. Mm. But the president appoints me, mm -hmm. and he appointed the chairman of the board. Appoints you and the chairman of the and board. The two, and the uh, two... And nominates... Or appoint. Okay, nominates. The word here is nominates. Okay, nominates. Okay, nominates. And we were appointed finally by him and the Public Services Commission. Okay. So there's a procedure. He nominates you and then the Public Services Commission finally confirms, you know, your nomination. Mm. But most of the members of the board are representatives from institutional bodies. Yes. Such as Institute of Chartered Accountants. Yes. Securities and Exchange Commission. Officer of the Attorney General and Ministry of Justice, Securities the Ministry of Trade, yes, all of them, Public yeah. Enterprises mm. Federation. So they are representatives, and all these are bodies that we, we, we liaise with. Okay. So they are representatives from those bodies. Okay. I was kind of hoping to hear that that's for um, women representation or something, because it was very specific that two female lawyers to be appointed, Maybe. nominated. Yeah, by that the is part of it. <laughs> okay. Um, bring us home. What will be your final words? This morning. Well, I just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity at least to let the public know about the ORC. As you, you're very right, quite a number of people are still confused. They think that uh, RGD is still the body that governs the you know, operations of businesses and companies. Mm. But just to let you know that ORC is here to stay. We are focused on business uh, registration and regulation and also on making uh, your work seamless. I mean, when you come to us, we are sure to give you quality service. That is our hallmark, quality service. World Make class. life world-class, quality, <laughs> innovative service. Make your life very easy. And it, the, all this is aimed at uh, the socioeconomic development of Ghana. That's the whole idea, okay. to make Ghana a good place for businesses to thrive. So that is my word for all my customers. And, just remember that we also have um, websites and uh, Facebook accounts and all those, Twitter and all that. Right. We'll put it up afterwards. Okay. So they can also drop us messages if you have any issues. And we are there to help. Thank you. You are there to help. Jemima Wari is the Registrar of Companies, formerly the Registrar, uh, Registrar General. General and also a member of the Federation of International Women Lawyers Association. And she was my guest this morning for AM Exclusive, bringing in all those updates and details in terms of the functions of the Office of the Register of Companies. Thank you so much for joining us for breakfast. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we'll take a break now. But when we return, we'll be joining that Stambi Graphic Business Breakfast event at the Badi Beach Hotel. Stick and stay.